Okay. Why don't you be seated, all right? Well, a couple of quick things. Um, I wanted to just mention uh, verbally from the front here that Easter is the most important holiday the church celebrates. And we as a church that we're all teed up to, to celebrate with gusto. So if you were watching up there, on Good Friday, we have two different options for you to acknowledge Good Friday. One is the Easter path, and you say, what on earth is that? We have rooms, as we did last year, that will tell the story. You start in one place, and in a 35-minute kind of circuit, you have an opportunity to have the Easter message, and what Jesus did for us, Good Friday, his sacrifice, and his resurrection, in an interactive way that's really family-friendly. And even if you don't have children, you might want to come because it's just going to be a lot of fun. So that's in, there's a sign-up in, in time slot, so you can do that back there. You can also do that online. Now, last year, we did not have a uh, more traditional Good Friday service, and some of, you, some of you mentioned you said that you missed that. So on Good Friday evening at 7 o'clock, we will be having a time of, of worship through music and communion, as we have done for many, many years, and we'll have the cross, and we'll be doing some of the things that we've always done. So you have two options there. Easter Sunday morning. Uh, you have options as well that we have our first services, one in the park. We've been doing this now for about 20 years, and uh, that's in the Watershed Shed Park. And if you need a map, we invariably have somebody get lost every year. I don't know how that is, but it, uh, you know, I, as a person who gets lost, often can relate to that. So we have maps. So anyways, you can see that. That's also in our monthly announcements is on the activity guide. And that's at 8.30, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? And then at 10 o'clock, we'll be meeting back up here. We'll have um, a service up here. So rain or shine, you know, this, the service will be down in the park. Rain or shine, it'll be up here. And also, we're adding something new that we're going to be having. Uh, we have, I don't know if we've branded it yet, but I don't know. We've been kicking around resurrection party or whatever. So for the children, instead of uh, just only having stuff that's special for the adults, that they're going to have just a special time where the kids are going to celebrate what Jesus did for them. And you know what? I love being with kids. And I think that's just going to be an awesome time. So I just wanted to bring that forward. Last thing, uh, again, in a shame, shameless plug for our men's ministries, uh, of which I'm a part, uh, this Saturday, we're doing something different. Instead of just doing um, a breakfast here at the building, we're doing something different. So uh, we're going to have a walk and run. You can choose uh, men. Uh, it's gonna, we're going to start at, at uh, Lottie's in my house. Um, and the information is all out there. But, we're, you know, if you walk or run or if you want to just come hang out, we'll have breakfast at 9 o'clock. And then we have a special guest speaker from our congregation who's going to share with the guys. So we're doing some different things. So just please be aware of that. And if you have never been a part of one of our men's events, let me tell you, this would be a great one to start with. So how's that? That's my shameless plug. So anyways, I have the privilege of being able to close our series post-Christian. And I ask this question. Is it the fact that we are now in a post-Christian era, is it a tragedy or is it an opportunity? We have to answer that question. And uh, again, one of the wonderful things that I love about our church staff is that we are made up of multiple generations now. So I am now on the other side of that. And then we have these new wonderful 20-somethings and and. Uh, Danny's right in the Danny Jones is right in the middle. I'm not going to say he's old. I'm not even going to say he's middle age, but I will say that he's right in the middle. So we have this exchange all of the time, and uh, one of uh, our twenty some things, <coughs> Danny Hunt, and I had a conversation, and he challenged me in a good way. And and you know I would talk about the golden age, and then he said, "Well, was it really golden?" And uh, so I had to kind of readjust that. And what I was able to say to him was that there was a place in time and space where Christianity had so influenced the culture that there was what I would know as a, a social contract. That even people who didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or who were not espousing themselves as Christians, there was still this understanding and an, about the rules. Tell the truth, honesty, integrity, work hard. Uh, we joked about this, and, and I'm not... Um, suggesting that 
Um, we should go back to that. But I can tell you this. My dad would say to me, son, if you get in trouble at school, you're in trouble when you get home. That was just the way that it was. And it wasn't like when I got in trouble at school, you know, that my dad would get on the phone and says, why were you beating up on my, my, my Tom and whatever. But he said, it wasn't like what did she do or what did he do? It was what did you do? Now, what we see is that even um, in though we are away from this, we're in post, and post means after, we're no longer in a situation where Christianity is seen as the dominant cultural force in our society. And so we can either see that as a tragedy or as an opportunity. So now I want you to really listen to me because some of you could get upset with what I'm going to say. I don't want mandatory prayer in the schools. I don't want that because once upon a time, when we said mandatory prayer in schools, there was the unspoken understanding that that would be the Lord's Prayer or prayer to the God as we understand him, uh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God. But now in a pluralistic society, if we have mandatory prayer in the schools, if the teacher is Buddhist or if they're, they uh, um, are involved in some Eastern religious tradition or they are Muslim, then the reality is, is that mandatory prayer doesn't say which God we have to pray to. So I read on the, on the internet and people are lamenting and, and they'll make statements like, we need prayer back in the schools. And you know what? I don't agree with that statement. We need Jesus back in the hearts of individuals. Do you hear what I'm saying? The, the prayer is the fruit of a, a dynamic relationship of Jesus Christ that transforms people's lives. So the school... The public schools, you know, some of you have the, the privilege of being in a, in a Christian environment, and that's wonderful. You know, I'm all for that. But I'm talking about in the public school system, the reality is, is that we need to be razor clear and razor sharp about what we're saying and what causes that we support. We need Jesus back in the hearts of individuals. Jesus didn't die for cultures. He didn't die for process. And he didn't die for nations. He died for people. And it is people who change their circumstances and the environment. And they are the ones who impact the spiritual atmosphere and climate. I think I told you uh, our good friend Jerry Cook, and we were at an elders meeting a couple of uh, elders meetings ago, and somebody says, who's speaking into your life currently? Because it seems like most of the people that spoke into your life are now with Jesus. And I thought to myself, he says, oh, yeah, that's probably true. There are some people who are currently speaking into my life. But Jerry Cook, who you hear me talk about, they had a very dynamic church in Gresham, Oregon. And this is, again, no reflection on Christian school. I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form. I believe that God has a plan for that. I really do. But I want you to know, and, and Jerry, because that church was so dynamic, the, the, the superintendent of the school called Jerry and said, I understand that you're thinking about starting a Christian school. And he says, would you please reconsider that? And so Jerry said, why? He said, because your students... Your people are such a redeeming influence on our school system. We need you to stay connected. It's a thought. Now, again, I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying for, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with people. Some people homeschool their children, and I want you to know that I support you making the decision that God wants for you. I support people who have their children in private school. I support people who have their children in, in, in Christian school. I support people who have their kids in public school. But all I know is, is that wherever, regardless of where you are, I would suggest just that there is no such thing as a Christian school. There is a school that is influenced by Jesus. Because Jesus didn't die for institutions. Are you understanding the distinction I'm making there? It's always about people. So here's the deal. We can either see it as a tragedy or we can see it as an opportunity. And so I would like for us to change the dialogue. I would like for us to change the dialogue instead of wringing our hands and saying, oh, you know, we've lost all of these so-called Christian institutions and, you know, people are this or people are that. Let me tell you something. I am absolutely convinced that we have an opportunity that we have not seen for a very long time. 
Now, again, I'm grateful. You know, uh, I, I really enjoyed Pastor Danny's message about claiming our baggage. There's something healing when people say we messed up. And that's what, that's what Pastor Danny talked to us. And so when people say, well, the church did this and the church did that, there's something very healing when we say, you know what, we acknowledge that. I was talking with somebody yesterday, and, you know, we were talking about the whole idea about, well, the church is full of hypocrites. And this is someone I'm very close to, and I said, but, you know, you know me. Am I a hypocrite? And he says, no. Well, then, it, with people, when they see one person who's walking in, in honesty and integrity, people can no longer say that all Christians are hypocrites. And he said, I totally agree with you. And had just a wonderful, rich conversation about faith and about what we understand about things. So here's my, what I'd like to put in your mind is this. I am fully convinced that I'm doing some market research this week. I am fully convinced that the majority of people that you come in contact with have no understanding of what Christianity is really about. And so instead of starting from a, a preachy point of view, this is one of the things I love about Alpha. It's been a wonderful thing. It's helping us to become sensitive and to ask good questions, to live in inquiry. Well, tell me about your faith journey. Well, who is Jesus to you, and what do you understand? What you know, and and it's really interesting when that people don't even know what they're standing against. And again, Paul the apostle did that. He went from synagogue to synagogue proclaiming Jesus. Jesus himself preached in the synagogues. They went to Mars Hill, the Areopagus, and it says that there were people that were looking for, for what was something new. And Paul says, he whom you have worshipped in ignorance, I now proclaim to you. This Jesus. Why did he die? Why did he suffer? Why did he, was he, was he crucified on the cross? What's the importance of Easter? Tragedy or opportunity, it all is in how we see it. In our theme this year, it's all about moving forward. So let's not have the conversation lamenting the demise of the influence of Christianity in our culture, but let's say we have an opportunity now to reintroduce the gospel and good news. So let's, I want you to turn with me in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. So Jesus asked this question. He said of his, to his disciples, who do you say that the Son of Man is? So we see here Jesus himself using inquiry. He didn't make a statement. He, he didn't get up and says, I'm the Christ. He said, who do people say that I am? Then the disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, this is interesting, following this, it says, but what about you? Jesus made it personal. And if there's any one thing that I'm observing is, is that sometimes in our sharing of, the, of our faith, we make it very generic and we make it very non-personal. But this is something, Oris Tershik, who's with Jesus and, and what is, was a very good friend of mine and was an enduring part of our congregation, Oris used to say this, everybody wants to tell their story. And I have to be careful about this because my natural inclination is to talk too much. That's my natural inclination. Or to make statements. But so Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter, God bless him, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my, my father in heaven. Now, this ties back into some of what we experienced when we just took time to acknowledge that the presence of God and built an altar. We can't build the church. And there's this constant deception that said, if we just have a bigger building, or if we just have more programs, or if we have a slicker experience, or if we, if we you know we have somebody who who's such a gifted orator that every Sunday he or she is on the stage spitting spiritual nickels. I am convinced that as I've been looking back at the first century and what happened in the first century, and I, one of the books I read on our holidays was The Triumph of Christianity. 
And how did this group of Galileans and, and 120 people that were in the upper room, how did they make a difference so that by the fourth century, a, a whole half of the Roman Empire were considered Christians? How did that happen? We'll talk about that. But here's what I want to say to you. The word of God is always true, and it says flesh and blood doesn't reveal that. So my experience is one of the reasons I don't like traditional evangelism courses because I have never seen anybody follow the steps one, two, three, four, five, six, and 7. I like the school of evangelism based on what we see in the story of John chapter 9 where there was the man who was born blind. The teachers, the Pharisees, wanted to engage him in a theological discussion. And the man said, all I know is this. Once I was blind, and now I can see. My father would say, Tom, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. I want us to confront Canadian culture. And this is not a Christian influence. But there's something in our Canadian culture that says you don't share your faith. That it is socially unacceptable. We're private, you know. Now, isn't it curious that it is only our faith that we're not allowed to talk about? We're allowed to talk about the movies we saw. We're allowed to talk about our team, how well it's doing or not. We are allowed to talk about the holiday that we just had. So why is it that we have this cultural restriction that says you're not allowed to share about the good things that God is doing in your life? It's a thought. Claiming our baggage, some of that has to do with the fact that we have not done a very good job, that we have unfortunately, instead of preaching the good news, we have been purveyors of the bad news. You're lost. You're going to hell. You're going to turn and burn. God doesn't love you because you are involved in this behavior or that behavior or you think this way or you think that way. What if we reframe post-Christian saying it's post all of the junk and all of the add-ons that human beings and their fallenness have added? What if we declare a new message. That instead of trying to come from all of the baggage, we say, yes, we claim that, but all I know is once I was blind and now I can see. I went to church this morning and my tendon in my, my wrist was, was out of place and we prayed and for the first time in, in a year, there's no pain. That's a miracle. That's what we saw happening in the New Testament times. It wasn't a theological debate. It was people's lives being changed. The woman at the well. Come, hear a man who told me everything about myself. And Jesus was able to talk to her about where she was in time and space. But he did it in such a way that she was excited about sharing that somebody cared enough about her, knew what was going on in her life, that she says, come and hear a man who told me everything about myself. Could he be the Messiah? And the Bible says that many people in that community came to faith because of that woman's sharing. Our testimony. You've heard me talk about this ad nauseum. When I was growing up, when people would move into a community, they had this thing called the welcome wagon. I don't know if they still do, but part of the welcome wagon that, that the people would go and says, hi, you're new to the community. And in that community basket or that welcome basket was a list of all of the churches. It was just assumed that people would want to be a part of of a dynamic community, or at least look like they were. So instead of saying and lamenting post-Christian, what if we really have the opportunity, just like the New Testament, to be able to express something that's new and fresh and dynamic? So think about that 
we need to think about that as a church. Again, that I can't build our church, that the Lord knows where those people are, but there will be people who will drift in from the greater community. But the majority of the people that will end up in a church somewhere and in some spaces because they have come in contact with people who have a living, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. Flesh and blood did not reveal it to you. And this is what Jesus went on to say. I tell you this, Peter, that on this rock, not on Peter, but on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is what is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is what is loosed in heaven. There's this constant pull of church. Even well-meaning people of somehow thinking that we can build it. And I just have been, the Lord has really been speaking to my heart about the fact that I need to renew myself to recognizing that we need to go about as citizens of his kingdom. We need to be binding things that are not of him, and we need to be loosing things that need to be loosed. And it's interesting, the Greek construction of this scripture is very interesting. It says that the things that are forbidden in heaven is what you forbid on earth, and the things that are permitted in heaven is what you permit on earth. So we're back to the fact that Jesus didn't die for cultures. And I don't want Canada to be a Christian nation. I want people in Canada to be Christians. Well, you know, look at all the church. That, yeah, but I'm the church. I, I'm a follower of Jesus. And all I know is that God has a plan for your life. That in the midst of difficulty and hardship, when you are facing the most difficult trials of your life, people are watching and they're saying, why is it that that person can stand in the midst of the trouble and the hardship and still know that there's a God in heaven who has a plan that's bigger than what he or she can see? So I'm suggesting to all of us in this, quote, post-Christian era, let's call it post. Post means past. Let's declare a new era. If you'll excuse the expression, a new age. An age where the church of Jesus Christ remembers who she is and her calling and her mission. I'll tell you this, I'm not good in a flat universe. I'm not good when I consider what's been lost or what's been changed or living in the past. It's death to me. All I know is that I sit here now these Sundays and the Lord this last year and a half has been just restoring and renewing and recalibrating my thought processes. And all I know is when I come here on Sunday, whether there's 550, 500 or 5,000, my responsibility, our responsibility is to come together to encourage one another, to pray with one another, to stand with one another, not to argue with one another, not to judge one another, but to be Jesus in a way that is God with skin on. So what are we to do now? So what? Now what? We need to acknowledge that our world has changed and that you and I are called to live as Christ's ambassadors and representatives in a post-Christian world. Prejudice does exist about the church and Christians, but see that as an opportunity and not as an obstacle. Many people don't even know and then this is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. He says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. My message and my preaching were not with wise and pervasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Let's paint a different picture. 
come, we have the greatest show on earth. Or come, we have a community of people in relationship with a loving God who care for us, who look us in the eye and sing, I love you, and I'm praying for you. What can I do? How do I help? And, you know, we, I, we had this conversation, again, generational things. I, I don't like seeing church as an event. I have a different de- de- a de- definition of event than Pastor Danny does. And, but for me, when I say event, I'm talking about church was never meant to be a spectator sport. It was never meant to be an entertainment center. It was never meant to be a social club. But the Church of Jesus Christ was always meant to be a place where Christians came together to love one another, to encourage one another, to support one another, to love one another in spite of our flaws, in spite of our faults. To be in an environment where we rub up against each other and what I can only speak for myself, but often when I'm getting rubbed, it's, it's, it's really easy to say, well, they're doing that to me and I'm learning to say, God, you're knocking some of the corners off of my life. You're helping me be more like you. So I want to declare a new day. I want to declare a new era that I want Sunshine Hills to be a place where the demonstration of the power of God's Holy Spirit is evident. That people come because Jesus is here. That we come and we look forward, and that was Danny Jones's definition of event, is an event something to look forward to. I can accept church being an event by that definition, that we get up and we say, Jesus, we get a chance to come today to be able to worship with others of like mind. We get to touch one another in life. We get to speak to each other. We get to pray with each other. We get to weep with those that need to be wept with. We need to be able to embrace people. It's not just something we do. It's something we are. I'd like to ask this question. I, my friend Dave Veach, who preached here in September, when I was talking to him about the girls, and you know he hasn't met Danielle's husband Levi, and, and so he says, "Is he a Jesus guy?" And I says, "Well, that's interesting. What do you mean?" He says, "Well, he says I'm asking because lots of people call themselves Christians, but I want to make a distinction. I'm asking you, is he a follower of Jesus?" So this will blow your mind I, as I've been doing some reading about all of this. For people in the, in, the, in the world, the world Christian, they have seen church or Christian as being everything that comes out of the United States or the West. So for them, in the, in the Middle East, when someone says, oh, you're a Christian, for them, they call women of ill repute and immoral Christians. Oh, that's a Christian girl which means she's easy. Now, you might say, well, that, how does that be? I'm, I'm just reporting to you what's going on. So when people say, you're a Christian, what they do is they see, we say, well, the United States is a Christian nation. So by extension, everything that comes out of the United States, whether it's a movie or it's a, it's a film or it's a book or it's what's going on in the culture, that's what they see. They have equated what The culture is being Christian when what I'm trying to do is let's rethink and what I'm arguing for is let's be Christians who influence the culture. Jesus didn't die for cultures. A culture can't be Christian. A country can't be Christian. People are Christians. So I read this book called The Triumph of Christianity and it's interesting There's three things that caused the church to grow in the first century. Only one God, high moral and ethical standards, miracles, and again, personal testimony. 
So what's one of the greatest impediments? People say, well, you know, people don't really like the fact that we talk about the fact that there's only one God and that we have to have a personal relationship with him. And in fact, in a pagan society in the first century, that was one of the things that drove the birth of the church where people were tired of all of these gods and, oh, I've offended the God of the, of the street or I've offended the God of my tree out in my yard or whatever. But what happened was is instead of there being some sort of animistic kind of a God. There was a God who was personal and said, hey, follow me. I've got a plan for your life. I want to interact with you. And so this blew my mind. I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, what are we, we actually trip over the fact that there's an exclusive relationship with God. That was one of the things that drove the first century church to be able to see lives changed. We don't collect God's we don't add God just as another one of our pan, personal pantheon. But what happens is, is we bow our knees before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is, is, is called. He has a plan, and he's a loving Father. That's the good news. Again, Christianity. Oh, it's about rules and regulations. That's not what the Word of God says. We made it like that. God has given us a standard. So in the first century when people were, were immoral and licentious and doing this and that and whatever, where the church came along and says, there's the plan for your life. Jesus said, this is how I want you to live. And it's not to be restrictive. It's all about the fact that he's saying, I want you to live this way because I want your lives to work. And so we got to reconfigure because what happens is Satan says, oh, Christians, Christianity is all about rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. But in the first century church to a society very similar to the 21st century, that actually was a calling card. That blew my mind. Think about that. And miracles. All I know is once I was blind, now I can see. My marriage was on the rocks. I met Jesus, and he changed my life. He changed the trajectory of my life. And so can I just say that for us to be the people that Jesus wants us to be, let's start not excusing our bad behavior. Let's start saying, Lord, help us to live the way you want us to be. Let's be his authentic witness. Jesus died for people, I already said. There's not countries and not culture. All I know is, is that God is asking for you and me to exercise godly influence. So I would like you to say, so what's the application? So we've talked about this, but let's really bore in on this now. Instead of lamenting post-Christian, we declare a new era. But the question is this. Are you, am I, an authentic and compelling influence in my spheres of influence. When I'm in my job, do people know that I stand for love and hope and peace, relationship? We were talking with somebody this week who will remain nameless, but this person is part of our church and said, but when there was a crisis in my, my, my workplace, people gathered around because they knew where to go in the midst of difficulties. If I got the story, if I heard the story correctly, there's a person who is either an avowed atheist or whatever, but because the circumstances are so difficult, he came and he stood by that desk and says, I don't even know how to pray, but can I, I want to be a part of this. Why is that? It's because there's this eternity in, in our hearts. Echoes of Eden. The local church is the hope for the world. The church saw themselves as representatives of Christ. I want to ask you this, and I'm almost done. I'm a little bit late because we had more time for ministry, but I want to just try this on for size. I think most people are resistant to Christ, the word Christ. I think most Christians are resistant, or most non-Christians are People are resistant to Christianity. What if, what if we started to change our vocabulary? Instead of saying, I'm a Christian, what if we started to say, I'm a follower of Jesus? So I did some market research this week. And I said, tell me, which of these titles is more 
compelling to you? If I say I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, and people, more than one person says, well, I struggle with that whole Christ thing, but Jesus is just all right with me. <laughs> you got that one. And then in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21, that, G, that, that Peter, when he, was, when he was preaching, he said, he quoted Joel, and he said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he said, those days are here. I don't want to get into a big eschatological end times thing, but let me tell you, it is my firm conviction that we are in the last days, and it's not because it's 2017. I believe that the last days began the moment Jesus' feet lift, lifted from this earth and he went back to heaven. It's the culmination of the age, and so all I want you to know is I believe that we are living in the most exciting times. Instead of us crying and complaining about, oh, let's embrace the challenge in this post-Christian era to declare a new deal. And finally, I leave you with this charge of Jesus. This is, this is 21st century language. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said, follow me. And I love this phrase. And I saw this, you know, in the this Jesus, Son of God movie clip where Jesus has this big, huge smile on his face, and he's looking at Peter, and he says, come on, let's go change the world. Let's go change the world. So, folks, let's go change the world. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for our time together this morning, and again, Lord, as for this series, and all I know, Jesus, that we change the dialogue. Instead of lamenting, we look forward. Instead of seeing the tragedy, we see the opportunity. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be your authentic witnesses. We pray this, we ask this in Jesus' name. Now, again, if you keep your eyes closed, uh, we give this opportunity. Maybe you're here, this is your first time here, and maybe you've been here countless times, but you've never made a personal choice to become a follower of Jesus. By raising your hand, I'd love a chance to pray with you. Is there anybody like that?